my in terms of background and where I grew up. Um, so I grew up in the Bay Area in a small town called Richmond, California. Um, it's a uh, it's a tough area. Uh, schools are not great. Lots of violence. Um, things of that nature. Um, I think things were, were so bad. I think my middle school was like ranked second worst in the in the state or something like that. So it was a terrible area, but uh, great community. Um, you just uh, learn to embrace it, and I enjoyed my my time there. So uh, grew up there. Uh, went to high school to Pinal Valley, which is the town over, um, and it was great. Uh, I, I was always into school. I enjoyed it. Um, I was that person that sometimes during lunchtime, I would go to my professor's room and work on special projects or, or things of that nature. Um, and in the evenings, I always did my homework and was super focused. So re really, I was always into school. I never knew where it would take me. Um, and given that my family was uh, working class, there were immigrants from Mexico. Um, I didn't have anyone to tell me, you know, go to college and have a career, things like that. So I just enjoyed school and I went along with it. Uh, once I got to high school and I started learning about, you know, college and universities. And that's when I really started looking into um, potentially going to college. And uh, luckily I was, I got super focused. Um, I was able to get into Cal and I was very fortunate, um, but uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, being the first in my family to go to college, there's tons of pressures. You don't know what to expect, especially in my place, in my situation where I grew up in a neighborhood or area where schools were not very good. So you can be top of the class, but at the moment you show up to campus, you know, you're, you feel like you're behind. Um, the good thing is that through hard work and dedication, you can get to that level. You know, you might struggle your first year. Uh, but as you remain focused, you can become top of, top of class of whatever university you go to. Um, so I was um, quickly learned that um, it was tough at first, but uh, but I got my way, and I'm happy to share some some thoughts and tricks um, as we discuss today. I think um, going into college, I thought I had it all figured out. I I wanted to be a pediatrician. I thought, you know, being a doctor was amazing. Working with babies um, would be awesome. Um, and I learned quickly. And it's funny. So two of my other high school friends got into Cal. So we decided to dorm together. And I said I was doing pre-med. And they said, we're doing pre-med also. Let's, let's do it as a team. Um, so we were all excited. And we thought we had it figured out. Um, and we got to campus and I started taking the pre-med classes like chemistry and all of that. And it just wasn't clicking for me. Um, and it was frustrating because I wasn't doing well in those classes. Um, I didn't find it interesting. And then I thought to myself, like doing this for nine years to become a doctor, like this is just the worst. Um, so I went through a phase where I was really struggling with school. Um, I would call my parents and tell them like, hey, this is not for me. Like, I, I can't do this, it's too challenging. I don't love what I'm studying. Um, I think I just need to go back and like, and stop this for a bit. And they would always tell me, just give it some time, give it some time. And I think uh, one, that's one thing for you guys to, to keep in mind as you go through low points is always give it some time, time heals. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I learned is, and what helped me was, I would keep it all to myself and only share it with my parents. And then one day I, I shared it with my roommates and I thought they were not going through those hard times and they just did a good job of hiding it. But then we all talked about it and we were all like freaking out. We were all going through the same situation. And the more people you meet, the more you realize that everyone's struggling with something. Um, in the moment you realize that you kind of normalize your, your struggle and kind of embrace it and, and make it part of the game. You know, um, they say like you learn the most when you're the most uncomfortable. And definitely that was the situa situation for me in college. Everything felt so uncomfortable. Uh, the student body looked different from my high school. Uh, the curriculum was way harder, faster paced, um, things like that. And that challenged me to, to keep up. Um, so, so yeah, so then I was pre-med. 
didn't really like it. Took a econ class. I loved it. And then I took a business intro class and I absolutely loved it. So I decided to pivot. And the way it works at Berkeley is that if you want to major in business, you actually have to apply to the business school as a sophomore or junior. Even though you're within Cal, you're not guaranteed a spot. Even if you have like the GPA or anything, you have to apply as if you were going to B school. And that's very stressful, but it was um, something that I went through. Um, so I quickly had to take all the courses, get ready. It's very challenging. So I quickly had to like go to career fairs and try to find an internship because it was almost a requirement to get into a school. Um, so what drove me and motivated me was that I took those two classes that I really enjoyed, uh, econ and intro to business. And I, I really wanted to make, make a career in that. And that pushed me and I went to career um, fairs all the time. And one, one trick for you guys is, um, it's all about relationships when you're looking for internships and, and jobs. And I remember at Cal at that time, in the fall, recruiters would go for full-time jobs, basically targeting seniors that were graduating. And in the spring, the companies would come and try to offer internships. But I felt like I was so behind my second year uh, because I switched from pre-med to business and everything was so new to me. I was like, hey, I'm still going to these career fairs even though it's targeted for, for seniors. And through those um, career fairs, I got to meet the recruiters. And they remembered my face in the spring when they came for to recruit for internships. And I was able to land my internship with PwC. Uh, surprisingly, pretty easily, I think, through, through that relationship building process. Um, and that just like helped me a ton landing that internship. So that's one strategy for you guys is let's attend the career fairs, be super proactive. Don't assume that things are going to come to you because they will not. Um, and, and kind of go, go after it, quote unquote. My PwC internship was amazing. Um, I was, it was in between my sophomore and junior year. Um, and it really opened my eyes to the business world. Before that, I had no sense of like business um, attire. So I had to go shopping and obviously did some shopping before my, my interviews, but now I was, uh, you know, I was wearing um, business clothes all week for my internship. Um, and it allowed me to meet a lot of other people that were, you know, sophomores and, and juniors that were starting their career. And it, it allowed me to bounce off ideas off each other. Like, hey, are we liking this? Is this something we can do long-term? And through the internship itself, it's, these internships are so valuable because the companies do a great job of putting together a very good and holistic um, internship experience for you. So they'll kind of show you what the company does. They allow you to meet folks that are that are leaders or partners of the firms. If you're thinking accounting or big four, big big four, sorry, um, and that helps you a lot because you learn if you you learn if you want to do this long term. So I love PwC, uh, PwC in San Francisco. I love that it was an international company. Um, and I love just the, uh, the potential of potentially making partner one day for such a big firm. Um, it just sounded amazing to me. So, so I did the internship. I actually ended up doing a second internship and then took a full-time offer with them. And on top of that, um, just from my classes, I enjoyed all my accounting classes. Like everything made sense, debits, credit, uh, my tax class was fun, um, things like that. So in terms of like CPA courses, I enjoyed them all. So I figured this is for me. Um, and, and I kind of went ahead with it and, and stuck to accounting at the beginning of my career. Just how I thought I knew what I wanted to do when I first got to college. Same thing happened again when I started my career. Um, as I mentioned through my internship, I thought accounting audit was for me. Uh, my first year there, I was heads down studying for the CPA, um, got my CPA, super excited. And then I took some time to reflect and uh, 
And I think it goes along with, it might be unique to me um, because I was like a first generation college student. So I didn't have anyone to explain to me like all the different fields in finance and accounting. I kind of started college. I had a positive experience with PwC and accounting, great career, but then I then have the opportunity to kind of find out what the other areas of business do. Um, so once I started my career, I started to do research, like what's, what's FP&A? Like, you know, what would a corporate finance person do? What would an investment banker do? Um, things like that. So you guys as college students, that's one regret that I have that I wish I would have like done more research in the business world and find out what exactly you want to do. Cause you can say finance, but there's like 20 different careers in finance that you can take and they're all very, very different. And I think the more research and like self-assessing that you do now, the better you'll pos position yourself to get that job. And I think my, my mistake was that my mentality was so focused on landing an internship, landing a job, uh, that I was excited to get something and I didn't take the time to fully assess what I really wanted. Um, so for you guys that you're still in school, like really take the time to self-assess. And this is not something that you can do in 30 minutes. This is something that you have to do over the course of a year, like keep a notepad and, and track like what you like about business, what you don't. Um, do you prefer marketing, something more creative? Do you want something that's heavy numbers um, like accounting? It's all business. A finance degree will lend you a job in any of those, but you have to make the homework, do the homework so that you really know. So I started my career at PwC. I worked really hard to get my, my um, CPA. And then um, most of my clients were hedge funds. So I would go in there and audit their, their investments, make sure that they're valuing their investments at a fair price because based on the investment validation, that's how much they charge their investors. So we had to check all of those things. And I found it very interesting. So then my next move was, I, wanna, I went into a hedge fund and I was an assistant controller there doing accounting and operations. And it was a lot of fun. It was based in San Francisco. We invested in technology stocks. We worked market hours. So the moment the market opened, we were like, have our Bloomberg screen and you would see the green and reds. And we were like, oh man, let's put in this trade. Let's sell this, let's buy this. What are we gonna do? Um, so that was every day. I would start work at 5.30 in the morning. I would wake up at four every day. Um, and it was fun. I didn't mind the time. Um, and what happened is I was doing accounting and operations there. And then you have the investment team and they do all the analysis. Um, to this, they build models, they decide whether to invest in a stock or not. So companies like Apple, sure, like Apple, when they go and do their investor call, they're always going to say they're the most amazing company that they're going to continue to grow. But as an investor, you need to challenge those assumptions. So that's what that investment team did. They would challenge the assumptions, they would do research, they would build their own separate models to see if, if it made sense what Apple was saying. Um, and many times you want to find an, a stock that's undervalued or has high growth potential. So you have to do a, a lot of due diligence. So I noticed that in my last six months there, um, just through curiosity, uh, as always, I asked one of the partners if I could help with like some investment analysis on the weekends or in the evenings. And he was totally fine with it. He was like, sure, like any IPOs that come up in like the software business, um, you know, create the initial model for us, let us know what you think, and then we'll consider whether to buy some stock or not. And that was amazing. I had to read through the financials. I had to create models, create assumptions. Um, we did research. We would call, um, so if it was a software company, we would call some of their top clients and ask them like, how's your experience with this software company? Would you renew your, your um, subscription or things like that? And, and that was very fun. I was like, wow, like it's finance, it's still numbers. But these guys, instead of like um, making sure like the accounting is done right and the credit debits and credits, which is very important, is done right. These guys are thinking more um, look, looking ahead and kind of building um, scenarios. They're, they're, they're looking at the numbers and they're saying, 
we've seen this type of growth for the past five years. Can they sustain that? Uh, what would need to happen? Um, say, if you're looking at a company like Apple, iPhone has been amazing, super popular. Is it going to remain like that in the future? Is something else going to re replace the smartphone? Maybe a, a smartwatch and we no longer need iPhones? Um, so as an investor, you have to challenge all those ideas. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And I was like, hmm, like I really want to do something where I'm modeling, doing scenarios, things like that. And I ran into a roadblock there because the investor, the partners were really open to giving me an opportunity, but they were also planning to wind down or close the hedge fund um, because a lot of the founding partners were close to retirement and that was on the horizon. So they're like, your best bet is, you know, we might not be around for so long, for much longer. You should go to business school and then try to, we'll give you like a recommendation to join a hedge fund. Unfortunately for me um, at that point, I, I didn't want to go to business school. Um, just personally, I was getting close to getting engaged. Um, my family kind of, my parents relied on me for, for income. So I just couldn't take a break to be realistic. So I struggled. Um, I was like, what can I do to do more of this modeling work without having to go to business school? And I would apply to different, different um companies and I would get turned down. I tried like FP&A jobs, um, hedge fund jobs. And I did that for like six months and I just kept getting denied, no luck at all. And one day I was part of a business club at UC Berkeley. And sometimes they share opportunities via email to like alums. And this lady that I knew, she shared an opportunity at Apple and I was, I was so heartbroken by that point that I was like, there's no point in like even applying because I'm like, if all these smaller companies don't accept me, there's no way Apple's going to get me. And I remember, remember mentioning to my wife, uh, her fiance at the time, and telling her like, hey, there's this great opportunity. Should I apply? She's like, yeah, you should do it. Um, and I did. And, and I landed the job. Like, it's insane. Um, so it just goes to show like two things that I learned there is like, never give up. Um, things are going to work out if you keep trying, keep working hard. Second thing is relationships matter. So whether it's like joining a club, like even within you guys, that like you guys are still in college and you might not think like, oh, I should network with like professionals that already have a career. Or I should network with like speakers that come in. That's all great and all, but between you guys, you guys have a lot of potential. So leverage each other, build relationships amongst each other because that's the true um, power of like networking at its more, most genuine form. Because you can network with people that are already career established, but are they gonna go out of the way to help you? Some of them will, the majority will, but not as much as like your peers. Like they'll go, they'll go to war for you. Um, Cause I do that with my friends. Like if I recommend them, I'll email the, hire, the hiring manager like three times. Like, hey, if you have any doubt at all, please let me know, but this is, this is the person for the job. Um, so you want advocates like that. Um, yeah, so yeah. then um, I landed the job at Apple that way through a friend and that, that got me there. And I loved Apple because I was doing financial modeling for the iPhone line of business. And then on top of that, it allowed me to do some strategic work, which was, for example, um, we would have to make decisions whether to include a new camera or not on an iPhone um, based on supply. Like we, Apple sells so many iPhones that sometimes like even if we want to include a new, say new camera, suppliers cannot produce enough to meet demand. Like we need to give them like years in advance so sometimes we're limited in that way. Sometimes from a net profit perspective, if you talk to the engineers, they want to include the best camera, they want to include the best battery. Um, but if you do that all at once, then everything, the product becomes really expensive for Apple and our, their profit margin like decreases big time. So you have to make these trade-offs. So we, I was constantly chatting with like the engineers, like, sure, like, a uh, battery that lasts three days is awesome, but that's going to kill our profit. So that's why like every year you see like minor improvements 
because they're like slowly baking in all these improvements because otherwise the profit margin disappears. Um, so we got to do really cool stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I think there's there's lots of interesting things. Um, and I think that's why I think business in general is so interesting because it could be so broad. So I mentioned, so we had, we wanted to make sure profitability was good. Um, so we felt terrible limiting innovation. Like you said, it did, it felt really terrible because we wanted to produce the best product, but we also want, we knew that our investors expected a certain profit. And if we failed, then our stock price would go down. And there's just so many negative things that come with it. But then you have other things to consider. Like we would work with the marketing team very closely to find out. They would try to estimate what's the demand for the next iPhone. Um, is it different enough for people to upgrade? Um, how's the weather looking for the fall in September? Is it going to rain a lot? Because that impacts whether people go to the store to buy it or not. It, so many things to consider. Uh, let's see, an interesting one, um, AirPods. If you were to go back and think about AirPods, like it's a headphone, the iPhone would come with its own headphone. So you would think like AirPods are cool, but only a few people would buy them and they're really expensive. Um, amazing product, but like who really needs it? So when we were going to introduce the product, we are like, Amazing product, it's going to sell, but it's not going to be super popular. And we were wrong. It was way popular. Um, we sold out immediately. Uh, every month, we would increase the, the amount of AirPods that we would produce. And it still wasn't en enough because every month, more people would buy and we would just get surprised. We're like, no way people are buying this many. And it took us like two years to finally catch up and realize like, wow, like this product is, is crazy. Um, so these are the things that you have to deal with. Um, so it, it be, you have to get a little creative because you look at the numbers and you might think like, this is not going to sell, but, but there's other factors on the creative side where this was a new type of product, like convenience, it looks good. It's, it's very handy. That, that created an outside demand for a product that we had not seen before at Apple. Because at Apple, they were always introducing new products and they were as successful. So we assume the same thing, but you know, everything's different. Yes, that was unplanned for. Um, I enjoyed my time at, at Apple a ton. Um, what drove me to make the switch was that um, I got engaged with my wife uh, while I was working at Apple and we were thinking about getting married and I was living in the South Bay, which is like South of San Francisco. And she was living in the East Bay and we were maybe like two hours apart and we figured like, Hey, if we're, we're going to get married, so let's centralize in San Francisco. So I started looking for jobs in San Francisco, um, so that it would work for both of us, um, so that was the main motivator. Um, I really enjoyed Apple, it was a great company. Um, and the second thing that I was looking for was um, something that allowed me to see the bigger picture. So at Apple, it was really fun because I focused on the iPhone and did a lot of what we just talked about. But at the end of the day, I was focused just on one product. Um, I wanted to do something higher level where I could see like the bigger strategy of the company. <laughs> and I ran into Gap Inc. And it's, it was an amazing opportunity because they own so many brands. And I was sitting at the parent company, so Gap Inc. So they would own Gap Brand, Old Navy, Athleta, Banana Republic, um, and a few more. And I love the role because we would help drive strategy for all those brands for, for Gap Inc. and everything. So it allowed me to see more of a CFO view of the company where I can see where are we investing, where are we not? Are we thinking of buying a brand? Are we thinking of selling a brand? Um, seeing that high level strategy was really fun. And also helping with like board of director um, presentations where we would try to, where, where we would um, come up with our budget for the following year. And then also like our long range plan, which is like a four or five year 
plan of like financial analysis. Like we're modeling out what we think the business is going to do for the next four years and explain the business drivers to the board of directors. And ultimately they approve because we quickly have to start moving and making the investments that we think are right so that we can continue to, to fuel that growth. Those are the different type of, of fp and work. So LinkedIn, uh, I made the move because I wanted to, Gap Bank was great, but I wanted to move back into tech. Um, and I wanted to be a little intentional about which tech company to join. And in my personal time, I do a lot of uh, financial literacy for like college students and high school students. Um, and I, as I did research, it's, uh, I found out that LinkedIn was a great place for me because it offers that. It's a platform where it provides and helps give people to like, allows them to network, allows them, if you have a subscription, then you can um, take courses through it, um, things like that. So it's just tied to my personal um, wants and needs. Um, so I was able to tie it to, to my job. So now I feel like I'm bringing my personal desires to my job and where like it's one goal. Um, and that led me to LinkedIn. And what I do here is I sit on the revenue side of FPNA. So when we're thinking of uh, building the business, like I help put together presentations for my VP and like the CFO, like where should we invest? Where are we seeing growth? Um, where do we see ourselves in three, three years from now um, based on what we're seeing in the market? Things like that. So fp &A stands for financial planning and analysis. So it's a type of finance. You have like investment bankers and you have fp &A, but fp &A are typically like finance folks that work within a company and they do a lot of forecasting and modeling that I mentioned. Yeah, no, totally. I have a... When I started my career at PwC, I had a friend that went to CSU um, Sonoma here in the in the East Bay, and like, yeah, like he's he's killing it. He's a uh, currently a CFO at a hedge fund, um, doing amazing work. Um, one thing that I will stress, and I think it's regardless of whichever school you go to, you have to take the initiative to find those internships and those jobs. Um, I agree. And you have to be mindful that at a CSU, it might be a little tougher, right? Because some of these companies might not go to it. Um, maybe the career first are a little bit less structured, but they know that there's amazing talent at those schools. So if you find a way to get to those career first or make an initiative or apply and make sure your resume and interview skills are polished, you'll, you'll do totally fine. I feel like CSU, UC, you can get to the same place career-wise um, as long as you put that effort in. Um, so I wouldn't be worried about, about it. And especially from a CPA perspective, at a CSU, you'll be able to take uh, many of your, your requirements. And then once you start your career, um, definitely start recruiting early. Uh, try to land an internship with one of the big four. There's also regional um, um, what do you call it? Accounting firms. So everyone goes for the big four, but like the top 10 are all phenomenal. And then once you're in the industry, you can either go to one of the big four or stay in those companies because um, they, they kind of lead you to the same career um, and you do similar work and they create great opportunities. Like I have friends that are like top in the top 10 accounting firms that are like close to being partners now. And they're just having an amazing career. I would just roll up your sleeves and know that um, that you might have to put a little bit bigger effort, um, but it's all on you. And, and there's no doubt, like they'll recruit from your school for sure. And they'll recruit you specifically. Yeah, now I think it, it's tough uh, to be honest. Okay, so think about it. So the best time to make that realization is right now as you're in college. And I know it's hard because you don't get to see what a day-to-day -day is and things like that. But I would say 
Google like each of these careers that you're potentially interested in, find out what the day-to-day -day looks like. There's so many videos out there, so many things. So do your homework because it's hard to decide now, but the more that you can get closer to you, to what you might like now will be a game changer. And it's because there's there are 20 careers, say, in finance, right? But once you guys transfer um, and start taking your business classes, you're going to have to take classes that are in that area that you're thinking you want to get into. So if you think you want to get your CPA, the majority of electives are going to have to be accounting, tax, um, things like that. If you're thinking marketing, your electives are going to be in marketing. If you're thinking financial uh, FP&A or investment banking, then you have to make sure you take some modeling classes, like financial modeling classes. And so the reason it gets so hard is because you have to take these classes that get you ready for that career, for that field. And once you start your career, you're basically on this trajectory. Um, say you start your career. Um, so say for myself, I struggled so much to move away from accounting into FPNA. It was like a year long process. I kept getting denied to the point. And another option, you know, if you if you find yourself in roadblocks like that and you really want to pivot, say from accounting to marketing, then a great, great strategy is to go to business school and do it that way, because that really helps you re-pivot your career. So um, a lot of people use that option um, if they're serious about changing their careers. The, the way that I did it is a little bit harder um, because you're just being scrappy and trying to get into it. Um, I did take financial modeling courses online through like um, UC Berkeley Extension. It's just like their online school. So I took classes through there. Um, I worked on my resume. I would reach out to people in the field um, and old friends from school and ask them like, hey, how do I break into FP&A? Uh, so it took a lot of work. Um, so there are that many different options. It's hard to pivot from one to other, but it is possible. And then another thing is it also depends on your company. Uh, so for example, LinkedIn, um, the culture here is that they believe on career transformation. So as part of their mission, they empower their employees to, to make these tra transformations or, or pivots. Um, so it's pretty normal for someone to raise their hand and be like, hey, I'm doing finance, but I actually want to do sales or I want to work on product. Uh, sure, they require you to like do a lot of work, maybe take some courses, get up to speed and, and interview for it, but they're supportive. Um, but then other companies might not be as flexible. They're more like more, you're like a finance person, you have to stay there. So high level, um, Try to do the most homework you can now to help you decide what you want to do. And if you start your career, you know, pivot as soon as possible if it's something you don't like. Because the longer you stay in something that you don't like, the, the more they assume that you're an expert in that field and you kind of get stuck there. So you have to be very quick so that you can pivot. Um, and people, if you do it quickly, people understand that, hey, you didn't quite know the industry. You don't like it as much, I want to try something new and they'll accept it. Yeah, no, it's tricky. The worst part is that an MBA is not even required. If I would have known, like, that's what I would have liked. Uh, so if I could go back in time, uh, when I was in college, I would have probably tried to interview for an investment bank um, and done that for like two years and then work and then moved over to a hedge fund. And once you're in a hedge fund, the industry is changing. Back in the day, it was required to have an MBA. The, the, the path for someone that worked at a hedge fund, it was basically, you do two years of investment banking, two years at a hedge fund, you, you leave for two years to get your MBA, and then you come back to the hedge fund as a principal or, or something, right? Um, but nowadays, like that's changing. A lot of people are just skipping the MBA and just, just working through it. Um, so that would have been great. And I know a lot of my friends, whether you decide to do hedge fund or FPNA, 
So some of my friends did investment banking and then to like a hedge fund. Another set of my friends went to investment banking and then at p a at a company. Um, and they're all doing phenomenal. Like for me, it's this, they're, they're, they're very close to like the director VP level because they had a very streamlined career. For me, I had to like move around so many times that from a title perspective, I'm definitely behind. Um, but that's because I kind of started my career in something that didn't help me get into FPA. Um, so it kind of kept me back a bit, but I'm glad that I was able to make the transition. But I would advise that maybe investment banking, if you can, go straight into corporate FPA if you if you think you would like that a bit more. A lot of big CFOs of big companies, sometimes they don't have MBAs, but an MBA, if you can get it will only help you. So I'd say no MBA if you have either like financial strains or you're very happy with your current job, um, you'll have a phenomenal career. But if you can get your MBA, you can afford it and it's, and it's part of your track. There's nothing better than the MBA experience just from seeing from my peers that did get their MBA. Like the network is amazing. You go on so many awesome trips, you learn so much stuff. Um, and you have an alumni group that you can always reach out to for like jobs and things like that. So not playing it down at all. It's, it's huge. It's amazing if you can get it, but I would just say that it's not a requirement. Okay. Yeah, one thing I want to emphasize is like taking initiative, right? Um, no one's going to do anything for you. Mentors can be amazing and they'll speak nicely to you and motivate you. But it's totally up to you to make it happen. Um, and one thing from my college experience, I mentioned the networking, lending the job through someone I knew through a business club. Um, that was huge. So while you guys are in college, I would highly advise you to get involved with clubs. Uh, maybe once you transfer out like fraternities, sororities, things of that sort, because these extra activities and even better if you take a leadership role in, in these extra activities will make you so much better because now in college, not only are you, are you doing the best to get the best grades possible, but you're doing this extra work and leadership work that's building up your skill set. It's teaching you how to uh, manage your time well. Um, these are all things that give you a leg up. And if you create that type of mentality and work ethic, it continues through your career. Um, and it makes you stand out and it makes you take ownership of your career um, to the point where you can ask people for stuff because they know that you bring the value to the team. For example, I have my normal job, but I'm also very involved with an affinity group within LinkedIn, which is the Hispanic group. So I lead sessions, whether it's like financial literacy, uh, bringing speakers, and this adds work to my weekly um, job on top of my regular job. But all of this makes me um, just a better person in general because I'm able to handle more work and leadership sees that. So when I go to ask for something, they know that I can take it on because I've proven that I can do my normal job and other things. Um, so for you guys, like get super involved because those experiences are amazing. And if say you have to work and go to college, that work experience is super useful because you learn a lot of things. You learn how to deal with conflict. You know how to motivate fellow employees. You learn how to do all these things that help you long-term. Um, so I'd advise you to get very involved with other things. Um, it's crucial that you meet a lot of great people, but you build skills that you don't learn in the classroom. Um, yes, uh, I think it's, they both work. Um, so I was, um, so Berkeley offers an econ major and the business major, but you have to get into the business school to do business. So if you don't get into business school, a lot of people default to econ and it's slightly different, but you, there's many hacks that you can do. A lot of people that are the econ major actually take um, a lot of the accounting courses because they can't get into like the business school accounting classes, but they take them online through like community colleges and things like that. 
So they take the initiative to still be able to take their accounting courses to be able to sit for the CPA. Um, but it is possible. So it's basically, you have to get creative to get there, um, depending on your major, because you know it determines the, the type of electives you can take, um, but totally doable, especially CPA route. Um, you can take a lot of those classes via um, community college online offerings, which in a way is also more affordable. So I actually took one of those um, um, while I was in undergrad because it just made the most sense. And I was able to take it during the summer just to like get ahead. 